Well, hey, it's Steve at Thousand Year Home. Welcome aboard. So what I'm doing out here is I'm building a modern house using ancient materials as well as modern materials laminated together. The style that I'm going after is a uh, Santa Fe Mission style house, which is like the Pueblo peoples. It's very organic. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot in harmony between like a mid-century modern home and a, a Santa Fe Mission style home. The um, simplicity of values but a modern home it's it's in repetition of of lines and uh here you see that i've got a rustic beam exposed and i'm at the point where i can have two decisions made i could cut a piece of trim and and put a uh you know carve that out and put a trim piece in there and leave a nice linear edge but I've decided that I, I prefer to go ahead and have it accentuated the flaw, which is the taper of the log. So I'm going to cut a piece of drywall that will follow along the edge of the log there and expose the natural live edge of the log. Now that takes a lot more effort from me um, in um, plastering, but I save time by not having to uh, chisel that all out or or cobble together a trim piece and then cover it up with a trim piece. So uh, that's kind of the design difference uh, that I'm ex after. I'm after the uh, Santa Fe Mission style vibe, which, uh, you know, as they mentioned, it's a little different than Spanish Revival or the Mission style houses here. I don't have any stone so uh, on this property, so I can't make, you know, a traditional Edward Limestone style uh, adobe <laughs> that you would find uh, in a lot of places here in Texas. Uh, anyway, uh, let me go ahead and set you up here and I'll cut that piece and uh, I'll cut it in a way so that you'll see that there's a live edge. I'll show you some other examples here in this house. Now here is a, uh, a beam, a log beam that I used in a corner around a window and if you'll notice the mud actually follows the contour of the uh, of the beam and honestly you don't even get the vibe uh, on video as much as you would if you were here uh, when you're here it, it's just um, very earthy very uh, natural uh, very inviting. It's, it's warm, even though the the it's not finished itself. And then here's where it would be like a mid-century modern. If I paint these beams black, let's say, and start white, you know, and and uh, the the standard pattern, bam, 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 all the way down. If you take a look at the ceiling, for example, you'll see the repetition of the beams carried out throughout the entire house. So, uh, you know, uh, it's kind of a crossover style Spanish mission is, but I knew that my skill levels would, uh, I'm not a master craftsman, but I knew that my skill levels would allow me to replicate a Spanish mission, a Santa Fe Spanish mission very nicely. And there you go. So let's go ahead without further ado, Work on this corner. I had some broken drywall. I bought it broken because it was the last of the 5 8 12 foot sections that I need. An 8 foot section would have been like 8 inches short and I would have had to put a seam in the ceilings or the walls and I don't particularly want to do that. Since I'm accepting the flaws and I'm building them in as part of the style, um, you know, this, uh, I didn't damage this entirely myself. It came like this. Now, the vendor didn't want to sell it to me, but it was the last of the 5 8 inch, 12 foot that uh, anybody had in this area. Uh, your mileage may vary. Where you're at, maybe you have many options. So let me clean it up a little bit here and uh, get it ready so I can put a, uh, a piece of drywall into it. So what I'm going to do between the roof and the uh, post is I'm going to get as close as I can and then I'll come in here with uh, tape and mud and I'll float this in and there's a few places where I want to make sure I don't hit uh, that screw head I might pound that out of the way a little bit or drive it in further um, anyway I'll, and then I'll come in here and I'll float this thing so it, it looks ready for me I'm going to measure that end which I'm going to guess is four or five inches this end which is two and uh, make a little piece that's tapered that'll fit right up there of drywall. So let me get working on that. All right, I uh, 
I made some measurements on there, the three and a half inch it turned out to be, and two down there. Now this isn't a perfect fit, it's a scrap piece, but uh, it's, um, it's hard to snap that kind of a piece without breaking it. This is so fragile. So I'm going to try it with a um, uh, jigsaw first and uh, see if I can get all the way through it without uh, breaking it. We'll see. Seems reasonable. There's a little roughness to it. It'll work itself out. All right, let's go hang it. It is a little cold out here today. It's still winter. Uh, first day of spring is coming up here. It might even be this weekend. Let me get this set up. Well, the first thing I'll do is uh, put a little bit, bit of this mineral wool in here. Uh, Stuff it in there. It'll expand up. Um, you don't want it totally compressed, but let me do that. Insects don't like this, so um, this material. And uh, of course, it you do want to have insulation in all the gaps anyway. So I really like this stuff. I'll do it around on the other side when I do the front side of the door. But for now, let me go ahead and fill up these cracks. You could use spray foam, I suppose. I don't because um, my idea is that spray foam will fall apart in a thousand years, but mineral wool is stone, so uh, you know I'm sure the vendor doesn't say a thousand years on, but it's stone, so in a thousand years I'm expecting that mineral wool to still be there, unless somebody takes that door out and does something else with it. So when I did the insulation, there's little little bits and pieces of insulation like this that I find on the floor and I'm just using them to, uh, to plug these holes up. Uh, I've talked before in other videos it's nice to build your own house because uh, yeah, I like this way a tiny home you could build without a complete project plan from beginning to the end because it's only 324 uh, square feet and it's already cut, delivered to you square. So you got the right angles, you got everything. But, um, so I can build as I go, you know, as I've got time and energy. Sometimes I buy things if I think they'll be uh, hard to get, like plumbing, I've been collecting parts of plumbing when I see a good deal. Ever since COVID where <coughs> deliveries are weird, right? I've been making sure that <coughs> I don't get burned with uh, shortages and I am off grid uh, in power and in a rural in the area so it's a little bit of a drive to get to a Home Depot not bad 30 40 miles but they're not the answers to everything I do have a local lumber yard but they're not very inventive they still do what they've always done which they've always done which they've always done you know I ask them, oh, do you got this latest and greatest thing? No, you know, I'm building a high-end off-grid house with a uh, Adobe and Earth bag and, uh, you know, Earthship style construction. And, hey, you know, I don't want to hear it. I just call it a metal frame. I, I've given up with the whole container. Don't call, even call it a shipping container. If you're in that book and you got a whole bunch of old-timey people that aren't very uh, forward-thinking, just call it a, a metal frame building they'll recognize that and and just treat it like a metal frame building to pull your permits to talk to people so you're not repeating over and over oh that one, blah blah blah, blah. Uh, lots of people have opinions and they have a lot of opinions when it's about something they don't understand <laughs> since we're talking about design and this little part here is is purely design there's nothing structural about this I guess it's going to keep the, the wind out, 
Uh, I'm going to go ahead and finish the whole thing up uh, in this video, including taping it and budding it, and uh, we'll go from there. So I'm a little short on, or long, let me cut the end of that off. But you know, plaster loves wood. In the old days, they would plaster and lath, right? So uh, as I do this thing, um, let's see here. I'm going to need to do some more jigsawing. Let me sketch out the uh, knots and lumps in this. And that's exactly how I did those pieces in the wall. This is just a lot easier because it's not 8 foot, uh, you know, 115 pounds. But uh, I want it to fit. All right, I got the rest of that. All right, back out to the jigsaw. I put a little bit of curvature in there to match the curve in the ceiling. I hope when I'm done that it'll just go right up in there. The thinner I get it, you know, the clumsier it gets. So I'll be right back. Now on the uh, the bigger pieces, when I did that, what I used is a compass with a you know pencil on one end, and I just trace from the logs onto this thing. I'm just eyeballing this one. Uh, again, it's not heavy. It's just a lot of little fiddly work. Let's see if that goes in there now. All right, let me get some tape up on there. We'll take a look at it. You know, there's a screw every couple of inches. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. I didn't punch all of those down. Normally I dimple them in, but that's so thin that I'm afraid I'm gonna crack it and then I'd have a bigger problem. So that'll be fine when I do the corners. They can have a little uh, organic edge in my style of the Spanish mission and that's one reason I picked it because I knew my craftsmanship level I'd be able to uh, duplicate an itinerant builder because I'm an itinerant builder so it's in my wheelhouse so uh, I like to use fiberglass tape uh, especially since I'm going to be re-leveling this house and I know that I'll need uh, all the help I can get so I didn't treat any of the posts, they're all natural. I wanted to brush them down with uh, oil before I did it or stain or whatever, but I wanted the plaster to bind to it as best as possible to make the joints as strong as possible. Therefore, I didn't do any of that. I will, after I'm all done with the uh, Italian plastering and all of that. So the last bit of my mud is, uh, it's, it's a little lumpy and uh, I'll see if it's, if I can, I'm just making rough joints, but that's not for a smooth coat. I, I, I've only got like a little loaf of bread left in a five gallon bucket, and I've been mixing out of it for a little while, and it's, it's a little lumpy. You want it smooth, like, um, applesauce smooth, and this is oatmeal, so I, I don't know. If it's too bad, I'll, I'll run the town and do this another day. I'm, I just would like to get this little spot done because it's a good microcosm of how I attach plaster to wood. Depending on the size of the scar, you know, I, like some of those I might fill in. Now I won't do that corner yet over there because um, I haven't put that wall piece up yet. So I'll focus over here and then I'll stop right before that corner. That wouldn't be normal. Normal, I, Normally, I would do the whole thing at once. I, I do it all, but uh, we'll just do this little spot here so we can get used to it. You can also see that there's some gapping here along the log. So I'll take care of that too. So we'll do that corner and that gapping and focus in on that so people can see how I would, how I will do that. So it does look like this piece of tape here might be too old. Let me cut off that layer. There we go, that's better. It gets dusty. OK, 
Okay, so you could see uh, that I've, I've just taped around that. Now I'll take the corner and I'll do the same thing with both edges here uh, that aren't taped at all. So let me go ahead and open up a new fresh thing of tape and uh, you can watch me do that. And I press it in and, and make sure that it's good and stuck uh, while I'm doing that. And like I say, normally uh, you want your, you know, your shorter pieces to be crossed by a longer piece so it holds them down and don't scrape too hard and leave little ends sticking up that you're going to catch with your trowel be smart with the way you do that you know tuck all your ends in cover them all up um, you know treat it like you would uh, you don't want it to get lifted because <laughs> you don't want it to get lifted see this piece of tape right here it's got a uh, a bunch of strays. I'm going to cut those off right now because I don't want those in my uh, along the edge of my tape getting uh, you know making a big mess so we'll cut those off right now so I'm not dealing with it a thousand times every now and then I have that not very often I don't know why guys still use um, you know the paper tape uh, no idea. I think it's just custom. This is such a superior product. And I don't have to, you see, I, there was no, I didn't have to f tape and float and stuff. I just put this on and it sticks. And it's fiberglass underneath, so you, you're not going to get anything. Paper's not going to have the same strength. Now you do want to, when you put this up, you don't want to wait a week, you know, and let it get all dusty and, and start peeling off. Uh, when you when you put this stuff down, you want to go ahead and get done. The same can be said with putting primer over drywall. You know, I see people do garages, professional uh, house builders do garages. They tape and float and then they walk away. Well, that was an extra premium. Man, they are wasting um, the uh, the the homeowners buy you cannot leave unexposed drywall to absorb the tape and seams to absorb moisture it'll peel and so that every house should if you're going to tape and float the garage uh they should spray primer on that at the very least i hate to hate it when i see that how cheap people paying three four hundred thousand dollars for a house and and they uh <laughs> they don't even do it right you know that's just not, uh, not cool. Can I just fold these into the corner? Uh, you know, maybe that's one advantage of the tape is that they, they have the pre-fold marks on there that uh, lets people see what they're doing, but um, you know, that's all I Probably tape and float later on today the whole place when I get that last sheet up of drywall. So I'll go ahead and do this wall here. When it's a big gap like this, I'll come back in and put a couple of, another couple of layers on it. This is exactly what I did uh, on the other parts of the house. Some of that spent more than a year and it's not even on a foundation. It hasn't left the log, it hasn't separated, it hasn't done anything but just stay there like good little plaster.
Okay, now you can see that I've got it all taped up. I'm gonna go ahead and mix my mud one last time and go ahead and uh, apply everything up on that piece. And you'll see me probably hit some of these as well on the ceiling. So I'll start getting some coats on there. I just use uh, floats for that. I don't use anything fancy. Um, I forget what the palette is that you put the mud on. I don't have one of those. All right, so I have a super rough coat in there right now, super rough. My mud is not optimal, uh, nothing's working well, but this is uh, kind of what I do. I do a super rough coat, and then I go back in with an angle scraper, and it just scrapes right off where it doesn't belong. So now I'm gonna use my angle, uh, my inside corner trowel, and I'm gonna go back up in there, and I'm gonna straighten that all out and make that look uh, presentable. And the way I do this is, I take just a little bit of mud, like a, a, you know, a dab of mud, and I stick it right in the corner, right like that. And then that lets me move through and make a nice smooth corner. So we'll start on the corner over here and smooth that all up. Like that. We'll just keep moving on. Now, if I, my mud was smooth like applesauce, these uh, would be uh, almost done. But uh, there's, I could see that the log is it's going to take a little bit. It's going to take a third coat, a third pass. Uh, because uh, I can see it it's needs more down here. But we'll keep working it just like that. All right, let me get that last bit of corner all zoomed in. You could see that I haven't done that. So I build up the plaster. A little bit, depending on what the wall asks me to do. So, you know, I'll dab a little bit in if I see some spots. And then I uh, do my trick of putting just a little bit on a corner of the trowel. Not much. I'll work it this way so you can see it. And I'm just pressing in and going. If my mud had been perfect mud, that would have been absolutely smooth. But I'll do a top coat on this and straighten it all out. This won't hurt a thing. They would have had better mud though than this in the missions, let me tell you. Well, maybe. Maybe. try to get pretty close uh, the very first time I just don't leave any little sharp mountains sticking up if I can help it and any place like that that there's a little little miss in the corner I go back through and add a little bit of drywall mud and chase it down
that don't look too bad, does it? And then the, once it dries, I'll chase it with a angle scraper. And uh, last thing I'll, since this is a rough coat, scratch coat, I'll go over it with uh, one of my six inch or, uh, you know, if it's a bigger area, it'd be a 12 inch trowel. But I'll go over it now and just kind of, you know, not overwork it, but just one little pass to straighten it all out. Let me zoom out. But see, you can see the organic now nature of the, uh, by following that edge and, you know, you can see the organic, organic nature of the log. Let me get my scraper. So those who been were watching closely, they, you would have saw that I dropped a lot of mud. So um, I don't put anything down because the floors are unfinished, but certainly I don't try to clean up any mud that I drop. If I wait till it dries, it just flakes right up and it's so much easier to clean. Uh, sometimes I'll take a wet sponge onto that and clean up the log a little bit. Uh, but then when it's all done and dried, see how I can follow, I've got one of these with a curve on it. Um, I could follow the shape of the log and I can cut in whatever edge. If I want to highlight a knot, I can go around a knot and carve a knot into the dry plaster, um, drying plaster like the next day. It will still, it's not hard, it's, but it's firm. And, uh, but I could still carve in it. So I'll carve it out and follow the natural contour of the log and accentuate it even more. And uh, I, I really like that. Let me get you up there where you could take a look at it uh, with me. I want to fix this one corner over here uh, because I don't want a lot of uh, sanding in a corner. And I really piled up a little bit too much mud here. So I'm going to fix it now so that when I come back later, it won't be um, as hard. So I'll do that now. But it definitely needs a final skim coat and um, then sanding and uh, I could take that yucky mud and give all these screw heads the first pass. <laughs> all right. Okay, let's inspect this together. There you go. You know that went from uh, horrible right in front of your eyes, horrible gap with insulation in it to a natural log edge. Now you'll say, Steve, why don't I get a washcloth and wash this off right now? Well, because what that does is wash the plaster into the wood and leaves a stain there. If I do this and I come back and scrape it when it's dry, it'll come a lot cleaner. And then I'll follow it up with a wire brush or a nylon brush then if I need to have a little bit here or there where I clean it up with uh, um, water, I will. Now normally that edge would have been taped and I would have floated the whole thing. But I just wanted to show you how I could accentuate a natural edge. I use terrible plaster. It uh, was just way past its prime, but it, it's all that I have. Um, I'll go to the store this afternoon. but. Uh, there we go, you know, that plaster. So what I'll do with the last of this is I'll go and I'll, I'll chase screw heads and scratch spots on the ceiling. And you won't have to watch me do all of that. So thank you for watching. This is Steve's little lesson on how I bond uh, live edge timbers to plaster right in a building construction. It looks good, doesn't it? Your eye wants to navigate there and, and linger because the organic with the uh, plaster, it's a clean edge. It's interesting. You don't get to see it every day. And so it's a good way to build, I think, especially in the Southwest where it blends in well with the Pueblo people and the uh, ancient Anastasis and all of those folks. Um, you know, it just blends in really well, the missions and whatnot. So this is Steve, a thousand years. Thank you for watching my plastering and I hope that you enjoyed it. And I will go get good mud. That's uh, over a year old and probably freeze thaw cycle. I don't know. So I'll get go get good mud.